Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to you all this morning, whether you're here in church or you're watching at home on social media. Morning worship next Sunday, the 3rd of October, will take place at 11.15 a.m. And we welcome our new Presbytery reader, Mr. Gavin Raleigh. And Gavin will be with us every Sunday going forward. With the arrival of Gavin to our Sunday services, we're also welcoming Mrs. Anne Dempster, who will provide pastoral care during the week. Her telephone number will be in our next newsletter. So if you know or hear of someone who would benefit from pastoral support, please contact Anne or forward her details. And this begins from October the 1st. Crossing Together are having Super Saturday. That's next Saturday, the 2nd of October, at the Birtree Hill Buildings from 12 to 2 p.m. And everyone is welcome to come and join for some fellowship that afternoon. Later that day, Saturday the 2nd at 4 p.m., there'll be a messy church here in the West Road Hall. And all are welcome, young and old, for music, stories, games and activities, all rounded off with a meal together. The first meeting of the Guild takes place this Tuesday afternoon, the 28th of September, at the Relief Birtry Hill Halls. Wednesday is a busy day for the church, as a new walking group meets at 1pm at the Relief Centre and will be led by another mission pioneer for sport. His name is Rob, and that will take approximately an hour, and you'll return to the halls for 2pm for some refreshments. And if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, the prayer group meets here this Wednesday, the 29th of September, at 1.15pm. You can submit prayers to the team, and that's Anne, Karen, Amanda, Lynn, and Betty. And they will be included in a daily prayer chain. So come along and join the group on a Tuesday at lunchtime if you wish to become involved. Following the prayer group, we have prayer time here in the sanctuary at 2pm, and there'll be a reflection at a quarter past two. I've received a very big, grateful thank you from the Irvin Food Bank, who received our Thanksgiving gifts from last Sunday. And an interesting note, if you happen to be donating food, please consider using a bag, because the charity spends approximately £180 a year on simply bagging the donations. So a spare carrier can go a long way. The deadline for the October newsletter is today for publication and uplift next Sunday. And the deadline for the September quiz is also today. And a winner plus a new quiz will be announced and will be available next Sunday. And finally, come through to the large hall after the service for tea, coffee and fellowship. These are all the intimations I have for you for this morning. So I'll hand you over to Shirley Bothwell, who will lead us in worship today. Thank you, David. Do you ever rip your mask off as if you've just performed a six-hour open heart surgery? Oh, it's good to get it off. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? I'm of a crowd in the Sunday school. Faces I haven't seen in real life. Two, a baby and a little boy I haven't seen in real life. I've seen you on the screen. So, welcome. I know you've been before, but it's really good to see you. Now, yesterday I was getting my stuff all ready for today when I heard this, this kind of musical chimes, musical noise. I didn't know what it was. So I thought it was my phone ringing in my handbag. So I went away and looked in my handbag. There was no phone calls. So I went back to get my stuff ready, heard it again. And I thought, well, maybe it's somebody FaceTiming me in my iPad. So I ran up the stairs checked my iPad, no, nope, wasn't anybody FaceTiming me. Back down the stairs again, heard it again. So I thought, well, maybe it's my alarm clock, the music starting. So I ran up the stairs again, checked that, no, nope, that was fine. I just couldn't fathom what it was. Until I was in the kitchen washing the dishes, it was an ice cream van. <laughs> it was the chimes from an ice cream van. I haven't seen one of those about for a while. Have you seen them? Have you? Well, your ice cream van must have come to my street yesterday. So now I know I'll not go chasing after the phone calls and iPads and wandering about the house, wondering where it's coming from. 
The psalmist writes, let all the earth acclaim the Lord, worship the Lord in gladness. Let us worship God by standing and singing together from Mission Praise number 564. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Mission Praise number 564. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to adore you, to praise you, and to rejoice in you. You are our God, whose power and glory is manifested in the earth and in the heavens by things both seen and unseen. You created the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, and the oceans, all living creatures, including man. Everything exists by your design, and all proclaim your majesty and power. You are our provider, the source of our health and well-being, the one who gives us our food, the one who made us steward of our earthly possessions. You are our light in the darkness, our reassurance when we are in doubt, our warmth when we feel empty and cold, and our comfort when we are in pain. You give us relief in our distress, and you bring us joy in the face of sadness, and spark cheer in the midst of drabness. You enlighten our, our small minds, you soften our hardened hearts, and you brighten the dimness in our souls. 
You are our friend when we suffer rejection, our companion when we feel alone, our hope when we get discouraged, and our balm when our spirits are broken. You are our contentment when we are dissatisfied, our stability when we are pushed and pulled in different directions, our serenity when we are rattled and pressured. Truly you are our God who is always with us, our God who never abandons us, our God who takes care of us, our God who protects us and watches over us. And knowing that you, our Heavenly Father, are all this and more, we confess all our sins and shortcomings. We have been weak. We did not always keep you in our hearts. We ignored your guidance for our thoughts and actions. And we succumbed to laziness and distractions and temptations. And we did wrong because of the things we did and did not do. Heavenly Father, we bring before you the ways in which we have distanced ourselves from you, the ways in which we have failed to recognize you in the face of those deserving our love. We confess that we have not always acted in love, neither to you nor our neighbor. As, as we have sought to walk the narrow road, we have often stumbled. We humbly confess to you all this, even although you already know the deepest secrets of our hearts. By the power of your spirit, set us on our feet. Take from us the burdens of our wrongs and empower us to live your will for us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. And now hear us further as we pray together, saying the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Everybody's fine. It's good to see Thomas. <laughs> Has he been before? <laughs> this is his first. Did you come just for me, Thomas? That was really nice. <laughs> when I was up at Drake in the Springside Church, I thought let him go. They put the flags in the bunting up in the street for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, no, don't tell me. That's other wee boy's name. I could be wrong, is it? It's not Theo, is it? No. Right, what's his name? Who? Connor. Connor? Hello, Connor. Have you been before? Yeah? Lots of times? Just last week. Just last week. Well, good to see you. Now, you'll come back if I'm going to see you. Oh, look at that. Have you seen this before? Now, do you want to come out?
Jesus loves everyone, doesn't he? And Jesus shines his light on everyone who loves him, doesn't he? Jesus loves everyone, and it doesn't matter if you've maybe made a mistake. Perhaps your mums have phoned you this week and said you haven't behaved just as you should have. You think you deserve a sweeter? <laughs> I think you should get a sweetie as long as you learn. You see, you've learned by the mistake and you try to do your best, and I'm sure that's what you've done. When you haven't done your best at school or you haven't tidied your bedroom or you haven't done the things you should have done. As long as you know that you've done wrong and you try to do your best for Jesus. Because Jesus shines his light on every single one of us. Boys, girls, mums, dads, coloured people, people who support one team, people who support the other team, people who are a bit lazy, people who have made mistakes. And we have to remember that we have to be shining a light for Jesus. Don't we, Thomas? Yeah, we do. So we'll remember that. And who's going to be sweeties now? All of you. I'm going to put you in chat on <laughs> Right, go and sit down and we'll sing your song. Thank you for coming up. In fact, before you eat your sweeties, I want you to clasp your hands and close your eyes. I've got a wee prayer here. And say this after me. Dear God, we thank you for each and every day. Please help us to respect and tolerate everyone, including those that are different to us. Help us to be kind and patient with one another, and always show respect. Amen. Now, the song we're going to do next is Mission Praise number 445, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Mission Praise number 445. <laughs>
And now we're going to have our readings read by Joan. Our first reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. We who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak to carry their burdens. We should not please ourselves. Instead, we should all please our brothers for their own good, in order to build them up in the faith. For Christ did not please himself. Instead, as the scripture says, the insults which are hurled at you have fallen on me. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through the patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. And may God, the source of patience and encouragement, enable you to have the same point of view among yourselves by following the example of Christ Jesus, so that all of you together may praise with one voice the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, for the glory of God, as Christ has accepted you. The second reading comes from Matthew, chapter 12, verses 15 to 21. When Jesus heard about the plot against him, he went away from that place, and large crowds gathered and followed him. He healed all those who were ill, and gave them orders not to tell others about him. He did this so as to make that God, what God had said through the prophet Isaiah come true. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and with whom I am pleased. I will, I will send my spirit upon him, and he will announce my judgment to the nations. He will not argue or shout or make loud speeches in the streets. He will not break off a bent reed or put out a flickering lamp. He will persist until he causes justice to triumph. And in him all people will put their hope. Amen. Again to God's praise from Mission Praise number 111, dear, Father, dear Lord and Father of Mankind, Mission Praise 111. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your presence, open the mind of God to us, that in your light we may see light, and in your strength be strong. Amen. Have you ever been stuck in slow traffic, wondering what's happening up front? You're a bit late for a meeting, and you should have been further on the road than you are. And you discover that the hold-up is a learner driver. It's only their second time out on the road, and they're doing 15 miles an hour. So what do you do? Do you sit patiently, or do you sit impatiently? muttering learner drivers, waiting them to leave the road? Or do you sit patiently until they eventually pick up speed, get into third gear, then fourth, and away in the road? Because once upon a time, you were that learner driver. Now as Christians, we have learned that we are to love one another, help one another, and accept one another. But in our Bible reading today, we learn that we are to have a spirit of toleration towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we know, we're all different. We are here from different places, with different backgrounds and different upbringings. And if we aren't careful, we can allow the differences we have to become a problem. We can look at others in the church who have some different ideas than we do, and we can conclude that we just won't tolerate them because, well, perhaps we think that they're just plain weird. However, it is our differences that make the church possible. If we were all the same, it would be a dull place, wouldn't it? It would be dull and boring. But the fact that we are all different allows the church to be a place where unique personalities meet and produce a dynamic that can be found nowhere else in the world. Take a band, for instance, and in that band there are all types of instruments. They sound different, they look different, and they all play differently. And you also have all types of musicians who have all kinds of playing habits. Yet when all of this comes together and all follow the leader and they stay together, they can produce some beautiful music. And that is what God wants for his church. When we allow the spirit of the Lord to operate in the church, we will love, respect, and tolerate one another and produce a symphony of harmony that the world cannot duplicate. When we all love the Lord as we should, when he is allowed to lead as he should, there will be peace, harmony, and power in the church. There's a lot of talk today in the world today about tolerance, and they say that we are to affirm other people regardless of who they are and what they do in life. That is what the world means by tolerance. An attitude that loves them just as they are, even when we disagree, or even when they're wrong. We might, might not be able to support their view, but we can still practice love for them. That is the theme of this passage. Firstly, we have a duty of tolerance to others. In the previous chapter, Paul has been talking about the weaker person, that person who needs rules to keep him straight, that person who likes to point the finger at what other people are doing. Paul has been drawing a contrast between the believer who is mature in Jesus and understands his liberty in Christ and the believer who has not reached that level of maturity and does not feel free to live in liberty. He tells the stronger person that he ought to help the weak to carry their burdens. We ought to help the weak to carry their burdens. And the word ought introduces a condition of obligation. It tells us that we have a duty to our fellow believers. And this duty can be carried out effectively if we practice two methods of life. If we're going to help others grow as Christians, then we are going to have to do what Paul tells us in the first two verses. We have to live a crucified life. We are told to help the weak to carry their burdens and not to please ourselves. And the whole idea here is one of self-denial 
and self-sacrifice. When Jesus went to the cross, he laid aside his rights for us. He denied himself, suffered in our place, and bore our infirmities on the cross. He set the standard that we are all called upon to follow. Now, one of the problems of our day, both in the world and in the church, is that sometimes people are so self-centered and so interested in pleasing themselves that they cannot see the need of others. This verse is a call for us to get our eyes off ourselves and to get them onto those around us so that we can reach out to them in the love of God and make a difference in their lives. In other words, when the church operates as it should, there will be times when you will voluntarily lay aside your personal rights and privileges for the sake of others who may be weaker in the faith than you are. There will be times when you will deny self so that the church as a whole may prosper. That is Christ-likeness in action. That is a crucified life. The second one is we have to live a constructive life. Now Paul moves deeper into his thinking to tell us that we are to please our brothers and sisters. Paul's not saying that we should try to live to please everybody because we can't please everybody. We know that. He's not teaching that we should compromise our standards just to make someone happy. He's not advocating a please everyone at any cost mentality. Paul is saying that we are to live the kind of lives that build others up in the Lord. The kind of life we live in the presence of others either has the power to build up or to tear down. Paul is saying that we should live the kind of lives that help others grow in the faith and that do not hold them back. And if that means giving up a few rights along the way, so be it. If that means that I have to deny myself along the way, then so be it. If it helps my brother to grow stronger in faith, then I'm to live to please him. We are to be like Jesus Christ, in that we live lives that build others up instead of tearing others down. And if we are wondering how we can look for an example of this kind of living, then look no further than Jesus Christ. Paul says that he is our supreme example of a person who lived his life for the good of others. In all that he did, Jesus is our example. He sets the standard that we are to follow as we go through life. Think of all that Jesus went through to provide salvation for you and me. He left heaven. He suffered poverty. He was reproached, hated, and rejected by those he came to save. Even his own family refused to believe in him. Ultimately, he was nailed to a cross, and there he died for a people who hated him, so that they might live. For us, the lesson is clear. We are to be like Jesus, even if we're laughed at even if we're ridiculed and reproached, even if we're hated and misunderstood, we are to serve others for the glory of God. That is what Jesus did. He lived his life to please the Father. And as a result, he was able to give his life for the world. And when we live to please God and do his will, we will have achieved the goal of being like Jesus, a living sacrifice. And we have the encouragement of the scriptures. The idea of this verse is that we go through this life serving the Lord, there'll be times of discouragement and defeat. And in those times, we need to look to the word of God. It is there that we will find encouragement. We will need to continue on, that we need to continue on for the glory of God. Again, we can look to Jesus as our example. He was tempted. He used the word of God. When he was on the cross, he quoted the scriptures three times. This shows us that in the difficult times of his life, Jesus used the word of God for his own comfort and strength. And if he did, how much more do we need that kind of help? When the difficult days come, and they will, 
you can run to the word of God and find help and strength to make it through those valleys. No one ever said the Christian life was an easy life. However, it's not an impossible life. There will be times when we feel like throwing in the towel, but by reading our Bible, it will enable us to continue on for the glory of God. In these closing verses, Paul uses a word, and this word is the secret of a great church. It's what makes it a powerful church. A great church is not because of its buildings. It's not because of the number of people that attend. It's not great because of the amount of money it has in the bank. It isn't the great singing or the great preaching that makes a great church. The secret of a great church is found in a little word. One. When we make a great church a unity, when we accept one another, we can love one another in spite of our differences. When we can accept one another in spite of our disagreements. When we can worship together in spite of our personal opinions. Then we are on our way to becoming a great church. And this kind of unity is accomplished through the practice of tolerance, as taught in these verses. And there's a payoff for being like Jesus. These verses tell us that payoff is threefold. It produces a unity of purpose. This verse tells us that we are to be like-minded. We are to have the same point of view among ourselves by following the example of Jesus. That is, we are to be one in purpose. And this was the secret of the early church. They grew by leaps and bounds because they possessed one common goal to see men come to faith in Jesus Christ. Over and over in the book of Acts, you read the phrase, in one accord. They were like-minded. They wanted to see people saved, and that was their supreme goal as a church. Everything they did revolved around bringing men to faith in Jesus Christ. And when we can come together around the goal and the purpose of getting the gospel out to as many people as possible, the Lord will bless that. When the church stops arguing over, see the color of the carpet or what kind of hymns we sing, who did what, and get our focus back on the primary task of the church, that of winning souls, we'll see results. After all, Paul tells us to do this according to Christ Jesus. According to Christ Jesus. Why did he come to this world? He came to die on the cross. He came to see people saved. It also produces a unity of praise. Paul tells us that when we rediscover the essential ministry of winning men to God, it produces an atmosphere of praise and worship in the church. Although isn't it true that we can belt out the hymn, How Great Thou Art, but do we go out there and tell others how great God art? <coughs> There's an inconsistency in our worship that needs to be worked out if we are to enjoy the Lord's power in the church. You see, we gather in the church to worship and be equipped by the preaching of the word of God so that we might leave the building and go into the world to serve the Lord. It's a great thing to come in here to worship, but it's equally great when we leave the church to serve. It also produces a unity of practice. When we are operating as we should be as a church, we will be quick to accept one another as we are. We will love each other in spite of our differences. We will learn to look at one another as the Lord did when he saved us. When we came to faith by Jesus, he accepted us just as we were. He loved us and saved us by his grace, and he welcomed us into the family of God. It should be the same way in the church. We are to love one another, receive one another, and accept one another, just like Jesus did us. And this same acceptance flows over into the realm of outreach as well. When we are telling others, as we should, a man's past or his present condition will have no bearing on whether or not we share the gospel with them. 
Oh, they might not look right when they get here. They might not know our language, how to dress, how to act in church. But if we can get them here, he will take them and make them like he wants them. And if he's happy with them, then we should be too. When we read in Matthews that Jesus will not break off a bent reed or put out a flickering lamp, he's referring to the spiritually, physically, or morally weak. But a damaged reed is not irreparable. A flickering lamp can still be reignited. So do we have a problem accepting others just as they are? When they are different from us, don't we have an obligation to love them and to reach out to them like a, with a Christ-like love and compassion? Nothing, nothing is more honouring to God than these things. So may they take their rightful place as the head of our priorities. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the peace and the joy and the righteousness that are gifts to us from your spirit at work in our hearts. Thank you for the liberty and freedom that you give us in these areas. We pray that we who regard ourselves as strong may be willing to bear the burdens of the weak and not to offend them or hurt them. May love be evident among us, Lord, but above all else we pray that we may manifest a spirit of unity to the watching world. We thank you for this miracle of unity among us and ask that it be preserved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Again to God's praise from Mission Praise number 932, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Mission Praise 932. <laughs>
Now let us come before God with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Father God, accept the offerings brought in this and other ways, and so take us and use us that in your service we may find our freedom, and in doing your will we may find our peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for everything we delight in, sunlight in autumn days, colour in nature and art, rhythm in poetry and music, human achievement and family success, good humour, work well done, love and friendship, and all your gifts to body and soul. Most of all, we delight in your salvation, the knowledge of your love, the assurance of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We give you thanks for your everlasting love. You remain our constant companion, share in our hopes and dreams, console us when we are in trouble, and are ever ready to help us when our strength fails. We remain in your constant debt, an obligation that can never be settled, to love you and our neighbour and care for your creation. Even when we forget you, lost in feelings of self-sufficiency, your spirit calls us and restores us to your side. Gracious God, bless those who are looking in the wrong direction, those who are living in the past, those for whom all the good days lie far behind, those who are trapped in nostalgia and who live simply with their memories. We pray for those who have allowed some sorrow to darken their whole horizon and let the sun set in their hopes and dreams. For those who have allowed some disappointment to sour rather than let them grow. For those who have allowed some quarrel to create a gulf that they will not even try to bridge. We pray for those who are living in the future. For those who are always putting things off until a more convenient time. For those who are waiting and not working. For those who are hoping but not striving for those who have mistaken dreams for deeds. We pray for those who think of their problems but who never think to turn to you. For those who tease at their worries till they cannot even sleep. For those who are conscious of their weakness but have forgotten your all-sufficient grace. For those who think of the things they might lose but who never think of the things that cannot be taken from them. We pray for those who are ill or in pain, for those in hospital or receiving care at home, for those for whom the way back to health is a long, hard road, for those who know that there is no healing for them, that they may play out their last act with courage and with faith. We pray for those suffering from memory loss and for their carers, for all who are suffering from mental health problems. Give them the support that they need and understanding and compassion from the wider community. Bless those who are elderly, especially those who live alone, who rarely have a conversation with another. For those who are not able to get out of their homes and can easily feel that no one cares. Source of love and life, there are so many in need of your tender care. We uplift, uplift to you in prayer all who need your healing embrace in the fragile and hurting world this day. Creator God, your creation continues to cry out for the destruction and devastation brought about by the climate crisis. We pray for everyone in the island of La Palma in the Canary Isles, whose lives have been upended by the volcano which has been erupting for days, covering towns in ash and forcing thousands to evacuate their homes. We pray for those in southern Australia affected by the earthquake, leaving buildings damaged and forcing hospitals to evacuate. For the people of Myanmar near the Indian border who have had to flee their homes because of the increased fighting between the military and the militia forces opposed to the military coup. We pray for all those whose daily lives are dictated by survival amid war and terror. For the people in Afghanistan, for the Taliban have refused to include women in the cabinet, 
We pray for all who are oppressed and targeted because of their gender. We pray for people gathered at the Texan border seeking entrance to the United States. And we are horror stricken by photos we have seen of people being rounded up like cattle. We all who are fleeing violence and trauma find nurture, strength and freedom. Comfort all in need this day. May they feel the consolation of your loving embrace. And now in the silence we pray for anyone known to us in need of our prayers. Bless each one of us, whatever our situation, whatever our need. Help us to set our hearts on things above, where Christ is, and find in him a rock on which we can build our lives. Hear these our prayers, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A shorter hymn for you, for a closing hymn. From Mission Praise number 796, You Shall Go Out With Joy. And we're going to sing it through twice. Mission Praise 796. of work, rest and pleasure. May all that we do this week be an offering of love as well as of duty. Keep us this day and every day in the spirit of kindness, simplicity and joy. And now may the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. <laughs>